Good morning. Good morning to all those who are online. It's wonderful to see you all and to all those who are with us. Well, I don't see them. I say that every week and every week I make the same mistake. But we'll, we just say we see them in the spirit, right? You all well? Yes. Wonderful. It's good to see you. Wasn't that wonderful worship? You know, it's just wonderful. I love that thing that I heard, which I've said to you many times when people come and they say, you know, I didn't really enjoy the worship today. And the pastor said, that's okay, we weren't worshiping you. And, you know, it's just so wonderfully true. And, uh, you know, we never want to make worship, uh, what is the word, a consumer activity. We are greatly blessed in worship, but we worship him because of his worth. That's it. Now, we are blessed. You know, I love that scripture in, in Isaiah 42 when it says, you know, the Lord arouses himself as a man of war in the praise of his people and shatters the enemy. It's like, it's like a child, you know, in the midst of all this, this serious battle and he lifts up his hand and all the enemy falls down because, they, yes, daddy did it. Yeah, and it's because, you know, there may have been a flashbang or something, but the child thinks it's because of what I did. That's kind of how it is with the Lord. We worship the Lord. We open, the, open our eyes and we look around and the enemy is destroyed, we say. And the Father goes, well done, look what you did. But it was him all along. You know? You've seen that ad when the little kid does this, the Star Wars, and the car starts? You've seen that ad? There's a little kid, he does something and the Father pushes the remote and he's like, whoa, it worked. It's kind of like that. It's kind of like that. So, all right, we've had a fast that we ended, I think, was it last week? forget. It feels like it's been a long time. We have testimonies pouring in, and uh, I'm going to share just a few with you, really just pouring in from the fast time. Can I have a... I, I got gum in my mouth. I'm so sorry about that. And um, so I just wanted to share some with you. Now, I haven't checked these with the people, so I cannot share the details because that would be wrong. But um, we have one which is wonderfully written and actually quite funny. Uh, it starts with, I'm 40 years old, been a Christian since I was a kid, went to Bible college for four years, but never fasted. And just, he writes about the amazing fast, just one day, but the incredible breakthrough and revelation it brought, just because of the truth of fasting. We have another one here. Some of these are long. I won't read them to you. Um, in business, we had an evening in the fasting where we, we said to people, bring your business cards, bring your contracts, bring whatever you can for your company. We'd love to lay hands on you, for your company, for your business, for whatever it may be. And uh, this gentleman came and uh, he said he ordered, after this he had an order, I'm trying to find the sentence, which I think after 30 years of business, it was the greatest order they've had. I wish I could find the sentence right now, I should have highlighted it, but I didn't. Um, one of the largest volumes of work in one wave than I can ever recall after having been in business, which was, I think, 20 or 30 years. He runs the business. Just after pray and fast. Amen? We have another one here. Uh, I learned from my sister that her son, I won't give names, experienced healing from extreme anxiety, agoraphobia. Her son described an electrical-like impulse that he felt go down his neck that coincided with a change in his vision and a relief of anxiety in his return to normal life. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. And there's many. There are many pouring in. We had a, a young lady who was an artist, and we, she came on the resources night. We prayed for her. And the first word that came was that you are the re that just someone felt to say, you know, you're the real deal. And she had actually struggled with the fact that she wasn't because she'd never sold the painting. And then the words of knowledge came, you, you know, this is how you paint. And she said, yeah, that's exactly how, what I do. And she left that day, and the next day, I think it was the next day, within the next four days, I forget the exact details, and I don't want to get them wrong, she sold a painting for the first time, and the gentleman liked it so much, he came back and bought three more. So after years of not selling a painting to one week of selling four, that's a, I mean, you can't argue with that. You know, that's awesome. Then we had a gentleman who's been unemployed, he'd been looking for work, so he came and we all laid hands on him and prayed for him, and I love it, all the people prayed for him, and he, since then he's received, not in writing yet, but just this week he received a verbal offer, and it's 50% higher, 47 or something, I don't know the exact percent, 50% higher of what he was making before with stock options. Amazing. 
How many of you know God's interested in your life? Yeah? All right, so let's, testimony, there's a part of the word testimony that, which I won't teach, which means do it again. Who um, is in need of work, job, I mean, we could say a raise, everyone's going to stand. <laughs> you know, if you want to stand for that, you go right ahead. But saying, Lord, just because of the recent season, who says, Lord, we need help? If that's you, stand up, please. There's nothing wrong with it. Stand up. Whoever wants a job, doesn't have one, is looking for a career, looking to make from a, from a job to a career, is if you want to raise, if you want something, stand, because there's something that, for some reason on this house, in this church, for some reason, by the grace of God, nothing that has to do with us, um, we pray for people, for work and for business, and it's just an amazing thing that happens. And you know, it's the Lord. It's not us. So can we pray for these people? Don't just watch me pray. You pray. Pretend you don't have a job and pray the best prayer that you would want someone praying for you. It's really just that simple. Father, we thank you that you are our Father, and that you are good, and that you are God, and that you have all power and all authority. And so we ask by your grace that these wonderful people, your people, would see such income and such increase in revenue to come that they will be blessed to be a blessing to your kingdom and to the nations of the world. We thank you for this, and we thank you for all the testimonies that are on this house in this area. And we say amen, let it be, let it be, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please send us testimonies when you can. All right. So I want to talk about marriage this morning, and uh, I always do series, but I'm not going to do a series, I'm going to do a one-off, which is rare, but maybe I don't want to preach a marriage series on marriage. <laughs> and if you notice, I'm just joking, my wife left, that's not because, <laughs> <laughs> that's not because we're not happy, we, uh, she was, she's gone into the children's church this morning. I told her I'm preaching on marriage. I was, she was like, should I stay? I was like, no, it's fine. <laughs> so Matt and Tash, I see you guys back there. I officiated their wedding. If you want, you can come sit in my seats up front. You don't have to, but you're welcome to. Um, the marriage lens. We are, it's actually, I took this, yeah, well done. Newly, newlyweds, come, have a, come, up, come up front. <laughs> she's like... They were both Marines, so I have to be careful to, you know, you don't want to make them too mad. But, um, you know, this is actually something that I preached at their wedding, just a little bit expanded. There you have 10 minutes, so it's a little bit expanded. So we're going to look at marriage, but it's not going to be, you know, there's many marriage courses out there, very good. We all know, communicate, we all know, love one another. We all, we've heard many messages and sermons on marriage. This is not going to be, in a sense, a typical message on marriage. And uh, we know that the cell phone, if I had my cell phone yet, hold it up, is one of the greatest destroyers of marriage. Uh, yes, it's a communication, but, uh, you know, social media and, and I would say iPhones, but all smartphones are now, I think, over 80% of divorce cases, those two are mentioned, social media and smartphones, because they just, it's like this all day. But there's a real person sitting there. And so there are interesting challenges in, the, in today's world. There's different personality types. There's cultural views. There's all sorts of things that we're not going to get into. We've heard a lot of that. But I want to speak about what I see as the key of marriage, of a successful, healthy marriage, and that is the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Here at Free Life, we desire to build a culture where people know God, because that's God's desire. And we know the scripture, I'm going to go over some stuff you've heard me say many times, just quickly. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. You notice that the gift replaces the wage? The gift of life, the gift of eternal life removes the wage. A wage is something you earn, a gift is something you receive. In John 17, Jesus speaks about eternal life, because this gift of eternal life is about knowing God. It's not about living forever in heaven. It's about, it starts immediately. Jesus said, John 17, I always just read verse 3, so I'm going to read three full verses. Wonderful. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh 
to give eternal life to whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is to know God. That word know comes from the Hebrew of the intimate, well, yeah, it's Greek, but it also comes in the Old Testament from the intimate, Adam knew Eve and they conceived. It's a very intimate knowing. And eternal life is to know God. J.R. Packer's book, Knowing God, it's a great book. Many things, it's just part of the passion of my heart, what it means to actually know the Lord. And because, you know, religion destroys, but I'm starting to preach a different message now. But truly, to know the Lord, to walk with the Lord, to know Him personally, to actually know Him, you know, is actually the point. Yes, we get the wage removed off of our life, of death, destruction, we get that removed. But it's not just a rescue, it's that. It's not just a deliverer, it's that. It's a relationship with Yahweh, with Adonai, with El Shaddai, who never changes. And we get to know Him and become adopted into His family. The Bible in Hebrews says both he who is holy and both the one who is holy, that's Christ, and the one who, those who are made holy, that's us, are of the same family. Think about that. And so we have a desire here to build a culture where people can come to know God, not come to know a religious process, but actually know Him. Because to know Him is actually the answer. If you have 10 problems in front of you, but you have something in your pocket that is the answer or the, the, or the solution to every problem, which should you get to know better, the problem or the solution? You have a solution. So everything that life throws at you, you have a solution. So get to know the solution well. So I have also had the opportunity to officiate at a number of weddings now, and um, if you ask me, I may say no, just because... <laughs> We're in a very busy season right now, but we have had, I have had the opportunity to officiate, and every time I do, I try to prepare it freshly, and a different message, and bring in the gospel. Just, it's not just something you want to go through the motions. It's more scary than preaching, because you get one chance. You know, you messed it up, and they're going to remember it forever. Remember that guy. You know, Dwayne and I speak about that, but the one thing I do, even though it's always different, that every single marriage I've done, and it, it may change, who knows, is I say the following things, undeniable truths concerning the first marriage. There's something when you read and study scripture called the, the law of first mention. Go look, to when it was, go look to when it first happened. And there's truth concealed in that. So when you look at the first marriage, there are some undeniable facts. These are them. God himself was personally involved in their union. In other words, his presence was there. His presence was involved in the first marriage. He was present. Secondly, marriage was God's idea, not man's idea. Hello. It wasn't man's idea. If you look into this, knowing that Christ came for a bride, you can actually see that part of God's plan, Christ was crucified, the Bible says, before the creation of the world. Knowing what would happen, that's outside of time. We cannot fully grasp that. But knowing God's plan for the world and that Christ would have a bride, there's something called intra-Trinitarian doctrine, which is a fancy word for saying things we don't really know, but we suspect from certain scriptures that there was a conversation before that the Father promised the Son a bride. And so all of this is a love story and a bride. And so you look at marriage, it's not just about you and me and, and us and how we my spouse and your spouse, it's about actually the something that God is putting into the earth to demonstrate to the world what love looks like, even when it's tough, because <laughs> it was God's idea. It was God's decision, not Adam's, that Adam should have a wife. It wasn't something Adam thought up, it was God's decision. It was God who formed Eve, not Adam. Hear me, men and women, you are not responsible for the forming of your spouse, although you may want to form them in your own image or in the image that you think they should be looking like, God formed Eve and God formed Adam. Neither of them formed each other. Easy to say, we laugh, go home, fight, hard to remember. <laughs> right? Let's just be real. God established the terms of the covenant relationship. Not them. Think about that. Not them. 
The first marriage, they never made those vows. God made them. Not them, not an angel, not a man, not a government. God. God officiated at the first marriage. <clears throat> you know when you're about to choke and you're standing in front of hundreds of people and you cannot choke? <clears throat> that just happened. God officiated at the first marriage and he will officiate at the last one. So the Bible is actually bookended by two weddings. Kind of a big deal. So, <clears throat> sorry about that. Didn't choke. It's a success. Over the years, you know, I'm married, so I'm learning every day. And the things I'm going to say to you are not things that I've done well or done perfectly. No one does. But there's something that Jesus keeps bringing me back to is the picture of Christ and the church. Christ and the church. Christ and the church. Christ and the church. And it offers up revelation. It gives you a lens through which to see marriage. doesn't mean we get it right, but it always takes me back and it, I can adjust and I can change. And so those They've, it's offered up certain truths to me as I began to study and look, truths that I know I can lean on because they're truth from here, and therefore I may not understand them or feel them all the time, but they will outwork themselves for growth and for betterment and for increase and for blessing and in my marriage. And some of you have been married longer than I've been alive. And so I thought I'd present you God's word instead of myself. That's never a good idea. But these truths, I just trust something that have been important to me. I trust they are helpful to you. My dad has said something over the years. It's always stuck with me. He said, whenever him, me and, me and uh, Michelle, if I was my dad, would fight or have an argument. We can't say fight, but that's really what it is. Or have an argument. And or, by the way, nothing I'm speaking about today has any context to do with abuse. Abuse is different. Hello. Abuse is different. But he said, whenever we fought and, you know, I go to the Lord, <laughs> he's never said to me, you know, Ken, you're, you're so right. I'm just shocked at her behavior. <laughs> you know, I've never had, can you believe, I just, I don't even know. I don't even, you know, never. He's always said, Ken, what about your heart? Forget her. What about you? And that has always marked me. It's always, you know, he tells it as a joke, but I've seen him do that. And so I've tried to do the same. And I found that it's true. <laughs> Lord, did you see? He's like, yeah, I saw, but I also saw this, 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 and that. So, we're going to look at a few things. Marriage and the fall. Firstly, we're going to look very briefly at the fall of mankind. Adam and Eve, as we know, believed in the deception of the enemy. And I won't go into this a long time. I was going to go into it a little bit, but we, it'll be short in time. They believed in the deception of the enemy. The enemy basically deceived them, telling them that God's holding out on them. Did God really say? Did this? Did that? And they ate of this fruit, and he said, you'll become wise. You'll become like God. They were already like God. They were made in his image, and God had wisdom to offer them. But what they wanted was... The, the knowledge of good and evil. And that doesn't mean good and bad. It actually means in the Hebrew, from good to evil. It's full knowledge. And I want my eyes open. So they received wisdom, but it was fallen human wisdom. It was not godly wisdom, which was what he had planned to give them. Hello. So, they believed the enemy. They were deceived. They thought God was holding out on them. We know they ate and the fall of mankind, and through that they sinned, and through sin, death entered the world, Romans 5. Through sin, death came through sin. And every person born since then is born with a sin nature. The Bible is very clear on this, very clear, a sin nature. So what was actually born, and many of you have heard me say this many times, what, was, what changed in man? Because you're still made in the image of God, but now it's been bent and corrupted. So Jesus came, he says, I will come in the likeness and image of man to restore the likeness and image of God inside man. That's in Romans 8. It's called good news. It's very good news. So they did this, and what was born was self. S-E-L-F, self. That's what was born in the garden. All of a sudden, they went from God-conscious. The Bible speaks about being God-conscious. That's, a, you know, 
uh, Duncan Campbell, the great uh, revivalist, he says that a revival is very simply an awareness of God that never goes away. God consciousness that can sh- spread over a whole country is an awareness of God, a conviction. They went from 100% God conscious to self conscious, and they became the center of their own world. Where does that nature come from? Well, the enemy. I'm not saying you're possessed, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. That's why Jesus looked at the Pharisees and says, Your father's the devil. I was like, Jeez, that's a little, that's a little harsh. What he's saying is the nature with which you're operating is not from me. What did the devil do in the fall? Go look at it in the book of Isaiah. Five things he said. I will ascend to the most high. I will sit enthroned above the clouds. I will, I will, I will. Five times. I, 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 I. What was born in the garden. You become a slave, the Bible says, to the one whom you obey. Who did they obey? The enemy received the nature. That was I, 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 I. Hello? We still friends? It's okay, I have a friend. She's not here now, but she's in the children's church. So, this is why 1 Corinthians 13 says, love does not seek its own desire. So, self was born. You've heard me say this before. They went from being God-conscious to self-conscious. Self-image, they realized they were naked. That was born in the garden. Didn't know that before. The Bible says they were, that, that actually God was and that he was made in his image that was clothed with a light, a garment of light. The glory of God, gone. I'm naked. The Bible says that in Psalms. Self-image was born. Self-righteousness. They thought they could fix their own condition by we can cover it up. So she took fig leaves and, you know, and sewed some things together. I heard an old preacher say, she made a bra out of leaves, and she made some underwear, and Adam said, mm, I like that. And then she went to go find him leaves, and she bent down, and the pressure and everything broke and fell off. Because the word atonement means to cover. It says they made coverings. But when you put what man can do to cover the condition of man, when you put that under pressure, it always breaks. That doesn't say that. He was just using his own imagination. But the first thing they did, that's self-righteousness. That was born to cover it up. We can fix it, God, when you can't. Self-justification. It's the woman you gave me. I love that he blames God. It's your fault. I had to do this because of something you did. It's kind of the same today. I didn't want to do it, but I had to because you did. So I had to. That's what he said to the Lord. You made her. We were fine. And now look what you did, you know? Self-preservation, blaming the wife, throwing her under the bus to preserve himself. It's a woman. She says, no, no, it's a snake. I mean, it's, it's funny because we all, we all do it. Now, what's the truth? Why am I speaking back to marriage? You don't see any of this way of thinking before the fall. None, zero. Now, this is what it has to do with marriage. God designed marriage, as we went over, before the fall. God instituted designed marriage before the fall of man. Meaning what? The nature that we're born with will not suffice to make a healthy marriage. We need born again. We need his nature. The old nature, the man, the old man, the flesh, whatever it says, will not do well in any covenant relationship because marriage was designed before that nature came about. That's why the greatest gift you can give to your spouse is a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ because he will change you. I find it very encouraging (laughs) because often when things become tough in a home, we think one of two things. My spouse is the problem or I am the problem. One of two things. What's true is sin is the problem. And I'm not just, well, just it's the devil's fault. You know, I just not just blame the devil. I'm not saying that. 
Yes, there's consequences, we have responsibility. But the issue is life outside of a relationship with God. That's the problem. That's the problem. Life, living life outside of relationship with our Heavenly Father. With the, as Peter says, we become partakers of a divine nature. And He gives you His eyes for people, even your spouse. Without Him, the type of love we need that empowers genuine, open, trusting, strong relationships in marriage will not manifest in your home. I don't care how much money you have. I cannot tell you the countless people I've met with millions, some of them hundreds of millions. They just cannot stay married. <laughs> and people have an idea, young people, they have an idea of what marriage looks like. They say, well, I love him. Well, I love her. I'm like, all right, well, we'll see. I don't say that, but that's what old people think. <laughs> Why? Because love is an action. It's not really a feeling. And as you grow together, it's that old truth of the triangle. You know that old, like that corny triangle, but it's the very truth. Christ up here, man and woman, the closer you grow to Him, the closer you grow together. That's absolutely true. It's just so simple. So fighting about them is to answer. See, you know, it's like when, I f when we fight, Jen and I fight sometimes, shock and horror. Yeah, oh my gosh. You know, I found the elbows, even now when I'm preaching. Don't give the elbows. You know, he's talking about you. <laughs> like, listen for yourself. You know why? They already know what they've done wrong. They already know what they've done wrong. Did the law in the Old Testament, did it ever power, power cha change? No. So why do we think that'll be marriage? Oh, it's gone quiet. Well, do you know what? Why do we think pointing it out will bring a heart change? Where for thousands of years, the whole point was, it doesn't. Grace does. I love you, despite. Oh, that brings change. Kindness leads to repentance. Grace leads to change. It's the same in marriage. The problem is we focus on what they're doing and how it's affecting me or how it's affecting the kids and therefore how that then now affects me. <laughs> so the power that God reveals through the new covenant is called grace. Friends, that's why love covers over. Love covers over a multitude of sins. There is a power that God can release to people to love the way he loves. It only comes from him. It only come, comes from Him. I'll say it again. It only comes from Him. Nowhere else. The old nature, the flesh nature, does not suffice for a healthy marriage. Doesn't. You can try hard, but eventually you will try so hard for so long, I decide no, no, in my arrogance. And then I was like really mad because she didn't see how hard I was trying. So then one day you explode and you point out, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this and I've done this and you've not done this and this. And so I'm, in a sense, better than you and you haven't noticed and so now I'm mad. You know, I didn't say it like that, but that's probably how she heard it because that's really what I was saying. We just don't think like that. So, love covers. Marriage was designed by God for the fall. fall. I trust that helps you. I trust it helps you because it actually is encouraging. My spouse is not the problem. I am not the problem. Life outside of a relationship with God, that's the problem. That's the problem. Secondly, know him first. I'll do this quickly. The Lord God said, it is not good, Genesis 2, 18 and 22. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And the Lord caused, I said this once, oh, I'm going to get in trouble here. I think it's 17 times the word helper or helpmate or help meet, that phrase in Hebrew. 17 times that word is used in the Bible. One times it's used for how, you know, for women, but the rest of the time it's used for how God helps man. And I told that to my wife and she says, I'm helping you like God. 
you know, God has to help you through me, you know, but the rest of the time it's actually used for how God helps man. But it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Verse 22, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place and the rib which the Lord God had taken from him, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. We have to understand why that's so important. The first face that she saw was God's. The first emotion she felt was from God. The first person she looked at or the first being was God the Father. First emotion, first heart, first call of love, for everything first, God. Same with Adam. First love that he experienced, the first protection he felt, the first power he experienced, the first affections of his heart, the first face, the first voice he heard, everything God. God, 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 God in the first marriage. Then he brought him and he brought her and they united them and we know what happened. But it was God first and I say that why? You cannot look to each other for things you can only get from him. Yes, you come together in marriage, and yes, you become one flesh, but there are things that you can only get from God. Do not look to your spouse for things that actually only God can give. They cannot give it to you. And that leads to failed expectations. I've seen many. They look to each other for something that only comes from him. Unconditional love. Whatever it may be for you. Healing. Affections. Certain types of holes in the human being being from the fall. That stuff can only come from God. And I've seen young ladies, they go from one guy to the next guy to the next guy to the next guy to the next guy. They're looking for something that none of those guys can give them. Not a single one. And the young men are naturally more selfish. It may shock you to know some of those men know that and pray on it. They're like, well, she's needy, so I can probably get her. Just blunt, this is how it is. Hello, am I crazy? No. Your spouse cannot provide you for what only he can give. And that's different for each marriage. Now this is what I really wanted to talk about today and we'll see how, if we can get through it quickly. Christ's bride. Certain truths that just the Lord has brought me to over and over. And I say, even though I'm preaching this, doesn't make me a perfect specimen or that I'm doing it always well. But it's truth that I lean on. So, there's two pictures of the church. Actually, I'm going to skip over that. Nope, cannot. I feel the Lord just like, nope. Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, the two times Jesus mentions the word church. Only two times. One is the global church, the church all over the earth. The other one is a local expression. Now, if you look at that and you take it into Christ and the bride, the first time he says, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against, you know, not prevail against her. Matthew 16 in Caesarea Philippi, Peter has a revelation. What he says there is very important for marriage, believe it or not. He said the enemy is actually real. Yeah, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. The enemy... <laughs> is actually real. There's an enemy who doesn't want your marriage to succeed, just like the enemy who doesn't want Christ's bride to succeed. It's no longer flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, it's the same thing in a marriage. Because that's Christ's bride. He's talking to his bride. There's an enemy, it's not me. I'm not, thank God, yes. I'm not your enemy. There's an enemy that will come against you. It's not me. It's the same in a marriage. There's an enemy who doesn't want your marriage to succeed because of what it represents. So stop fighting people. Learn, not even sometimes fight the enemy. Worship him and the enemy will be dealt with. Very important for marriage. Second time he mentions it, Matthew 18. He talks about the local expression. And he says, you know, we're two or more gathered in my name. If anyone sins against you, go to the elders of the church. And he gives you a whole process. But then he goes into this great parable of forgiveness. You know, the king who forgave the servant this massive debt and then lets the servant go, lets the man go, and he wouldn't forget and forgive another guy a tiny little debt. And that's in a local expression. He's saying, for my bride to be healthy... It will require great forgivers. Now it's the same in a marriage. 
as it is in Christ's bride, so it is in us. Forgiveness doesn't mean revenge. It doesn't mean I get, they know that I'm this great forgiver. Sometimes it just means someone's got to take the hit, even if the other person doesn't know. Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife, said, a healthy marriage, I think I wrote it, yes, a happy marriage is the union of two, of two great forgivers. And they stayed married for a very long time. So, Christ and his bride. We're going to go read this, Ephesians 5. If you could turn to Ephesians 5, verse 22 to 33, we're going to read it. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. You know, in this culture, what I'm about to read will be offensive just reading it. Just reading the Bible. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, That's not because of fancy wrinkle cream. It's talking about your heart. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without uh, holy, sorry, and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. And he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Many years ago, my dad preached a very short message on this. It was one of the best I heard. He read that and he said, so husbands be respectable and lives be lovable. And then that was the end of his message. But let me quickly, we're going to zoom in a bit. It says, submit to your own husbands. The own is very important. The word own, actually very important. As to the Lord. Some people take that, submit to them as to the Lord, this great king. But actually, if you look it up and you study the Hebrew, which I'm not going to go through, or the Greek, I mean... Submit to your husband as to the Lord. Well, how do you submit to the Lord? Freely. Hello. Freely. Do you submit to the Lord by force or by choice? Oh, we're rattling some cages this morning. Put your toes out and I'll step on them. Both times Jesus spoke to the disciples, he's about to birth the church. They're about to birth a church on the earth and be the first in Luke 22. And they said, well, who's the greatest? They're arguing about who's the greatest. They missed the point. And Jesus basically talks about serving. He says, do not lord it over each other as the Gentiles do. In other words, leadership from the authority I'm going to give you cannot look like the world. Don't lord it over them by force. But the one who is greatest among you will serve. The other picture of leadership you get is in 1 Peter 5, where Peter talks to the, to the elders, and he talks about the flock, the body of Christ. And he says, do not, um, you know, uh, can I quickly read it to you? I don't want to misquote. He says this, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So you know when you think you're going to get there faster. And, uh, it says, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, also important, among you. Serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those. It's the same. Do not lord it over by force like the Gentiles do. But being examples. That word example is the word ensemble. It's an old, archaic English word that no one uses anymore. I used to be a medical rep for medicines and sports, you know, people that looked great. I used to sell all the products. And that word sample means something to me, because I used to travel around in my car with samples, a little bit of the whole. He said, when, you lead a ch- when you're in a position of authority of leadership, be an ensemble, be a sample of what he's like. 
be a sample to give them something to look for. Not just an example in morality and character. Be as if you're a sample of the real thing. It's very similar in marriage. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Well, Jesus had taught them, be a sample and don't lord it over. You will find if you want to stomp on your wife, <laughs> submission doesn't happen. <laughs> Toes. As to the Lord, I ask you, how do you submit to the Lord? By force or by choice? Do you grow in it? Why? Because of unconditional love. <laughs> we'll move on. Husbands, love your wives. We're going to focus in on verse 25 to 27. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. What does that mean? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. The Greek there says, gave himself up. Some of your translation says, gave himself up. He's not saying, you know, just about I gave my life for her. He is saying that, but he's actually, it actually means when he gave himself up to the authorities. That's what it's talking about. So firstly, it says, Christ also loved. Does it say loved or loves? Loved. Past tense. That doesn't mean Jesus doesn't love the church anymore. No, he's gone to prepare a place for us. It means what? Now I'm speaking to husbands. Well, I'm to wives, but I'm a husband, so I'm speaking to husbands. It means the action that he took to demonstrate his love, which was the cross, to give himself up to the authorities, to be falsely accused, beaten, and go on the cross. So he took an action. It wasn't just in word, and it wasn't just in thought. So it says, husbands love like that. It's like that old joke that says, you know, my husband never says he loves me. And you tell the husband, and he says, well, I told her I loved her when I married her. And when it changes, I'll let her know. Like, that doesn't, that doesn't work. It's, it's in action. He took an action. That's why it says loved, past tense. It's talking about something that he did. Something that he did. That's the first. And I said, secondly, he gave himself up to the authorities. Why? To become a sacrifice. So as a husband, as a husband of the bride, he went to the cross. Think about this. And I know this is challenging. Again, not saying I'm doing it perfect. I'm just telling you what the Lord has shown me in Scripture. He went to the cross, didn't deserve it, didn't do anything wrong. He, he did that, sacrificed himself. Why? Just to give his bride the freedom whether she would choose him or not. Think about that. Just to give her the choice. Think about that. The first thing our, our husband did as the church was leave the throne. And then you get the men say, well, I'm the head and I'm the this. And yeah, yeah. The first thing our husband did was leave a throne to come and die to give a choice. When you love that way, Watch your wife shine. Watch her shine for Jesus. Shine for you. Shine with you. As a husband and a spouse, there will be moments where one can step in, like Jesus did, and take a hit. Boom. Based on what the other has done or said or forgot to do. My encouragement to you is to see it as an opportunity. Every time that happens. I have done this for my wife, Jen. She has done this for me. Many times she has. When that happens, when she's done that, because of something I've done, said, or when it's the reverse, you know what's amazing? It no longer matters the thing that we lost because someone did something or the deal we didn't get. None of that suddenly matters. Our relationship is suddenly deepened in a new way because I've de demonstrated value over something else for her. Or she's demonstrated value for me over something else. She steps in. I'll take the hit. I won't even bring it up. She won't even bring it up. We'll take the hit because of my love or because of my value for that person. Even though right now, 
You know, my wife sometimes says, I love you, but right now I don't like you. Even though it may feel like that, there's a choice, and that opportunity will bring strength in a marriage. And all of a sudden, what was lost is irrelevant. It's irrelevant. You know when you see older, older people in the audience doing this, and you see younger people like, huh? I, say, I don't like that. It's every day. Every day is opportunity there. You said what? You said what to them? Well, I'm going to go see them tomorrow, and I'm gonna, now they're going to think this of me because of what you said. So what's that? The old nature. What you did is going to affect me. I don't want that. <laughs> or you come home, and things aren't as you think. Either way, husband or wife. Now all the plans you've had for the evening are gone. And they've suddenly changed, and now it's not the opposite of what you wanted, and now you have a choice. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Love does not seek its own desire. Well, I had desires too, you know. I wanted to do this, and now I can't, and you, and now the kids are because of what you did. Now that, that that's easy. You know that? That's easy. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. What does it mean that he may sanctify and cleanse her? I, my job is not to sanctify my wife. <laughs> I'm going to be the law. I'm just going to point out all your faults because I want you to be holy. No, that, that ain't, that ain't going to go well. No. What does it mean? I'm going to go another six or seven minutes. You guys good? That he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. What does that mean? I used to read that. I'd be like, that sounds awesome. What does it mean? That he may sanctify her. And by the way, it's actually talking about Jesus and the church here. The King James says that he might sanctify and cleanse it, being the church. But then at the end says, it's about marriage. That's what I say. Christ and the church is for marriage. He might sanctify and cleanse her, the church or it, with the washing of water by the word. Some people would tell you that's baptism. I do not think that it is. I know in my heart that it's not. I'm happy to be proven wrong, but many books and scholars and so forth would agree with what I'm about to tell you now. With the washing of water of the Word. Now, this is part of the core that I actually wanted to bring to mostly some husbands today, including myself. In order for us to understand this, we have to understand something of the Old Testament really quickly. When they built a tabernacle, they would go into the outer court and they would have... I don't know how far the camera goes, so I can't walk over there. And the first thing you would have is the brazen altar, where they would sacrifice the animal, right? That would represent the cross. Then you would go from the brazen altar, and you would want to go into the most holy place, and, I mean to the holy place, and then in the most holy place. But in between the sacrifice and the tent was something called the bronze laver. So now, think about this. You have blood. You've atoned for sin. You've got the blood. Sin's been atoned for. It's great. Now I'm going to go into the, tab tab into the tent and sprinkle everything with blood. It's kind of gross, but sprinkle everything and do and atone and do all these things. But now there's this thing on the way in, this bronze laver. What's this about? Well, the priests, in order to go in, had to wash their hands, their face, their feet. They had to clean themselves before they could go in. But what kind of cleaning is that? I've already been cleaned by the blood. I'm washed in the blood of the lamb. I'm already clean. It's, I'm clean of atonement. So what's this? It's the dust and the grime and the dirt of the world. And you know what that bronze laver was made from? It says it in Exodus 38 verse 8. It was made from the mirrors that woman, think about it, for the purpose of beautification. Think about the bride that the woman who took these mirrors from Egypt in their deliverance, they took these mirrors and they gave it, and it says from those mirrors they made this bronze laver. So the priest would wash, would sacrifice, and then the first thing he would look in was a mirror. It was clear water with a mirror at the bottom in a sense. And he would see what? Prophetically, his new identity. I've come, oh, I've been made clean by Jesus. I've been made clean. I'm washed. What's the first thing I see? Oh, I have a new nature. I'm new. All things are made new. And it's, the Bible speaks in James 1 about the word 
being a mirror that we continually look into, and as we continually look into it, we see ourselves different, and we see the law of liberty. Not Old Testament law means that in the spirit realm, there's been a law that's been passed, and it's called liberty. And as we continue to look into the law of liberty, we are changed and transformed. So the priest would go from this, he's clean, he's washed in the blood. Oh, now I'm looking in this thing. Oh, I'm new. Look at who I am now. I'm a different person. That's the washing. That process is the washing that Paul is talking about here. It's the same thing he talks about in Hebrews 10. So he says, read it again. Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that's rhema, speak to each other, revelation, that he might present her to himself. So, to sanctify means to separate. It's to separate from the world. So, what does it mean for a husband? <laughs> it has to do with holiness and identity. As I said, the first thing I see after the brazen altar is my new creation. So, now back to marriage. What does it mean? The sanctifying of the bride means the husband lives toward his wife in such a way to separate her, wash, from an inferior reality of her old nature. But as a mirror, meaning what? Meaning what? You guys still with me? This is just the Bible, right? <laughs> Sometimes... We have issues in marriage where she drives you crazy. Let's just say it. And, or you, you drive her crazy. You know? So I'm going to speak to husbands very quickly. It is often, even though it looks different in that person, and I'm not saying she's not her own person, but you become one flesh, that she is reflecting back to you yourself. It doesn't, it's not what you do. Why? Because it's going through the filter of a different person and a different personality and a different sex. It's going through a different filter, but what's going in? It's like a re some of the things that drive you mad or drive us mad or drive her mad is a reflection. She's reflecting something right back to you. I'm not saying she's not in charge of herself. Can we be friends? It's just a reflection. It's just going through a different filter and it looks different. So we say, I wish he would just stop doing. So we go to the Lord, and like we said, he doesn't go, I'm shocked. I'm shocked at her. <laughs> Why does the Lord say, Ken, Clayton, look at your heart? Because he knows something we don't. He goes, let me change you, soften your heart. Let me work with you. Choose love. Because you will find <laughs> she will change or he will change. What was it for? It was for the purpose of the mirror, the beautification of women, of the bride. So husbands, love your wife. The Bible says that Christ loved the church in this way. He gave himself up for her. When she looked steadily into this law of liberty, when she looks at Christ, this is now for the whole church, even us men, when, she, when we look at Christ, the Word made flesh, it's a mirror that reveals to us our true identity, that what we have been given. And the more I look into it, the more I reflect it. That's what Jesus did for his bride. Paul saying to husbands, can you be that for your wife? <laughs> can you be that for the wife? I hope that makes sense to you. So when something happens, my issue is no longer to, it's not fix your wife, it's love your wife. So as much as I want to fix and form her into the image I think she should be, that's not, it just doesn't work, doesn't help, makes it worse. We all know that. Let me do it again, but we all know that. So what do I do? I love, and I choose 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 love. And then over time, the reflection 
begins to be different. And if it doesn't, I choose love, and I choose love, and I choose love. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up to authorities that had nothing to do with what he had actually deserved or done, but in so doing, provided an opportunity for her to live in the actual identity of who she was. In that way, be a husband. So, I've got to say something else, because it's, we can't end right there. I'll just read the, next, the, the rest to you. Fourthly, love gives. God so loved the world that he gave. Love gives. Both goes both ways. Love gives. Love gives. Love gives. It's a verb. Think of it this way. He loved those who were by nature opposed to him. The Bible says we were born children of wrath. God loved. Jesus loved those who were by their very nature opposed to him. He loved those who were blinded to who he was. The Bible says that. He loved those who accused him falsely. They crucified him. The bride crucified him. They loved those who were blinded to who he was, those that accused him. He loved those that didn't understand how much it cost and what he gave. He loved them anyway. What does that mean for us? In marriage, there will be times when love will be given or acquired when they are opposed to you. In other words, when you're fighting. There will be times where you have an opportunity to choose love. Because right now, they're opposed to you, just like we were to Jesus. There will be times where you can choose love when they don't understand you, just like we were blinded until God opened our eyes, couldn't see. You know, he just doesn't understand me. Choose love. Because Jesus chose to love us when we didn't even see him. There will be times when it's like when you've been, you feel misjudged, even accused. Same with Christ. There will be times when they don't understand what it costs you. I find this more true for the woman. I'm not being sexist or anything like that. I find it more true that men just don't always have an understanding of what the price that she's paid. And I hear it in counseling. He just doesn't know what it cost me, what's costing me. I encourage you to choose love. Love anyway. Love anyway. The Lord has loved you and that the Bible says we can love him, our husband, because of how he first loved us. When you choose love, you give the opportunity for that love to be reciprocated. But even then, you can't force it, but you give opportunity over and over and over and over and over and over. And I'll read the last one. Laughter is medicine and joy is strength. That's what the Bible says. Sometimes you don't need another prayer meeting, another vacation, another honeymoon. You know what you need? You need to have fun, for real. Laughter is medicine, the Bible says, and joy is strength. I'm a little bit of an intense person, and I'm much better, but I've, when we got married, I said to my wife, force me to have fun, force me. Force me to have fun, and she did. She would, we're gonna go out tonight, we're gonna have fun. I don't want to, I'm gonna read the Bible. Honey, we're going to go out tonight, and you're going to have fun. Yes, ma'am. And she forced me to have fun, and we would leave, and I'd say, that was amazing. It was so much fun. She's like, I know. But I knew enough to ask her, make me have fun, please, because there's a healing in it and a power in it. And we'll close with Chris's word wherever the phone, the microphone is. I know I went over. Thank you for your grace. I trust it's been helpful to you. Yeah. Go for it. Just stand next to your cheek. And yeah. <laughs> Come up here, Chris. I'm official now, I guess. Yeah. So, um, it's, it was interesting. So Clayton was talking, and um, um, I, this has happened to me in the past. As soon as he started, I, I smelled lilies. The Bible calls the Lord the lily of the valley. And um, it says that uh, your presence releases a fragrance so pleasing over and over poured out, for your lovely name is flowing oil. And usually, he's taught me in the past that when I smell something like that, it could be bread or it could be lilies, it's typically one of the two, it's his presence. Yeah. And when he comes, he usually wants to do something. And a lot of times, it's healing. And so, literally, as Clayton just started talking, I'm going, oh, there must be healing for people. And as he was talking, I go, oh, it's for marriages. He's so good. He doesn't want to talk about this. There is so much to cover in marriages. I get that. And it's not a condemnation if you're not married or you're divorced. If you are married, 
Would you mind standing, even if your spouse is not in the room? Wonderful. Wonderful. We want that oil to come upon our marriages. Our marriages testify to the glory of his kingdom, whether we know it or not. And the enemy works double time to tear us down, right? Everything you hear, don't get married. It's going to end divorce. It's, that's a lie. That is a lie, right? So I just want to pray. I just want to bless you. Um, forgiveness. I will tell you right now, the Lord has spoken to me in saying that there are issues in our marriages because there is no forgiveness. So I'm going to ask to search your heart and come up. Is there something blocking? Is there forgiveness that I need to I give to my wife or my husband? Can I interrupt for one second before you pray for us? Let's stay here. Can you just close your eyes real quick? I'm going to ask you all to repeat this after me if you're married. Say, Lord, I forgive him or her. Even if they're standing right next to you. Lord, I forgive. Just give it a moment. I forgive. I forgive, Lord. I forgive. I don't hold it against. I don't demand repayment. I just forgive as you forgave me. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord. We just welcome you. We welcome you in our marriages. We welcome you in our lives. Father, I just pray, pray a blessing over every marriage right now in the name of Jesus. I pray a blessing and a hedge of protection. I pray, Father God, that you would just invade the marriage, invade the marriage bed, invade, invade the conversation. I just release the oil of heaven over, and I pray for healing in every aspect of your marriage. I pray, Father, that the kingdom would come upon every marriage in this room and on television. In the name of Jesus, I declare that over them. And I have a word if you're not married and you want to be married. I declare you will be married in the name of Jesus. If that is your heart's desire, I come against that lie that says it's not going to happen because that's a lie. I declare in the name of Jesus, you will be married and you will have a great marriage. So I bless you and thank you. Awesome. Give that to Josh. Amen. I trust today is helpful. I know it's longer. All I really wanted to do was give a lens, just a lens through which to look. Over to you. Thank you for your time. I know I went over. I appreciate your grace.